This is the thought vlog for the book Innovator's DNA by Jeff Dyer, co-written by Hal Gregerson and Clayton M. Christensen. The key theme of the book is that creativity is primarily a function of behaviours, not talents. Four of the five behaviours, questioning, observing, networking and experimenting, are ways to get new ingredients, new influences, whilst associating is about bringing all those new ingredients together to make new dishes, new ideas. So what is the ideal environment for this associating to take place? Well, first off, you need a broad knowledge base, lots of different disciplines to draw from. But as the innovation consultancy IDO says, that's not enough. You also want deep knowledge in one of those areas to create what they call a T-shaped knowledge profile. This then allows the creation of odd couples. This is an associating method that helps in the creation of new ideas. Oftentimes this will involve exporting ideas or practices from your area of expertise to another area of knowledge. Or alternatively it might involve importing a concept from another area to your deep knowledge area. For example, Google's Larry Page with Google brought together the odd couples of web search and academic citations which involved ranking papers on the basis of the number of other papers linked to it. Another associating method is to zoom in and out on a problem. Skype co-founder Nicholas Zenstrom says, I can look at the bigger picture and also have a very good feel for the details. So I can go between high-level things to really, really small details. The movement often makes for new associations. Third is Lego thinking. The idea of building incrementally, block by block, on past ideas. So we've just considered the first discovery skill associating, which is about bringing all the new ideas together. But where do you get those new ideas from? One of the ways is questioning. For example, Orit Gaddish, chairman of Bain and Company, was helping a steel manufacturing client. At the time, there were two ways to make steel, one by ingots, and the second, continuous casting, which at the time was new technology. Having seen continuous casting firsthand in Japan, she asked the client to change their manufacturing process. The client refused, saying they couldn't change because they have 350 different products, and that amount of variety can only be done by ingots. Gadesh then questioned again, why have 350 products? The client ultimately ended up reducing down to just 30 products and with the competitive advantage of continuous casting went on to great success. Gadesh is just one of many examples of innovative thinkers who aren't afraid to question. What Jeff Dyer and his co-authors find is that the first thing innovators do is they try and describe the territory. They ask questions like what is and what caused the current situation. Next, they disrupt the territory, asking questions like why, why not and what if. In fact, innovators who strongly agreed with the statement, I often ask questions that challenge the status quo, produce twice as many new businesses as innovators who simply agreed. A famous example of an innovator asking why is Toyota's Taiichi Ono and his famous five whys as a method to delve deep into the assumptions of why things are done the way they are done. Another sort of question that is asked is what if, but considered with constraints. Marissa Meyer, CEO of Yahoo, formerly an executive at Google, points out that creativity loves constraint. People often think of it in terms of artistic work unbridled, unguided effort to a beautiful effect. If you look deeper, however, you'll find that some of the most inspiring art forms, haikus, sonatas, religious paintings, are fraught with constraints. They're beautiful because creativity trumped over the rules. You can also consider what-if situations without constraints, for example, what if money wasn't an issue? What would we do then? The third discovery skill is observing. 
As Dyer says, by observing how things work, you become sensitized to what doesn't work. For example, Ratan Tata of India's automobile manufacturer, the Tata Group, saw a rain-swept family of four crowded on a scooter. This got him thinking, why don't they buy a small car? His answer was to build a cheap car built around scooter technology, the result being the $2,200 Nano, generating more than 200,000 orders. IDEO's Tom Kelly, author of The Art of Innovation, has written that the anthropologist's role is the single biggest source of innovation at IDEO. In fact, Kelly was at home one night and noticed that children's toothbrushes were just miniaturized versions of adult toothbrushes. But children struggled using them because they have less dexterity. His answer was to lead Oral B's creation of big, fat, squishy toothbrushes which became market leaders for the next 18 months. It's also true for Starbucks founder Howard Schultz. Whilst at a trade show in Milan, he became intoxicated by the smell of Italian espresso bars. He thought, this is so powerful. What we had to do was unlock the romance and mystery of coffee, first hand in coffee bars. It was like an epiphany. It seemed so obvious. If we could recreate in America the authentic Italian coffee bar culture, it might resonate with other Americans the way it did with me. Schultz stayed another week in Milan just to spend more time visiting coffee bars. He went to Verona and noticed someone ordering a cafe latte. Having heard of the drink, having never heard of the drink before, he ordered one for himself and the rest is history. The fourth discovery skill is networking. Albert Einstein, someone who I at least imagine in spending a lot of time in a room by himself, staring at the ceiling, says, What a person does on his own without being stimulated by the thoughts and experience of others is even in the best of cases rather paltry and monotonous. Ron Burt, a sociologist from the University of Chicago, found that people with broad social networks that bridge what he calls structural holes, the gaps in between social circles that don't overlap, think a rap star and a theoretical physicist perhaps, are much more innovative. An example of the power of a broad network is that of Joe Morton, who went to Malaysia, talking with people he heard about a native fruit called mangosteen. He rang up his brother, who was doing a PhD in medical sciences, to ask if any research had been done on the fruit's health benefits. In fact, there had, and it showed that the mangosteen was jam-packed with goodness. For example, mangosteen is anti-inflammatory. This led Morton to found Zango, a fruit juice company that evolved into a billion-dollar business. Some tips for creating a diverse group of connections include mealtime networking. Read Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi for more information on this. Also look to regularly attend conferences outside your area of expertise. Even watching videos from the conference TED might spark new ideas. Also, try regular personal networking groups to meet up with and they can act as a good sounding board. The final discovery skill is experimenting. There are three components to this. The first is trying out new experiences. One of the most famous examples is Steve Jobs' trip to an Indian ashram. Research in fact has shown that people who live in a foreign country for at least three months are 35% more likely to start an innovative venture, product or company. Another example is Nate Alder. Whilst on a trip to Brazil, Alder learnt how to scuba dive. And in the process of getting his scuba qualification, he learned that argon gas was used as an insulator to keep dry suits warm. Being an avid snowboarder, he thought that maybe argon gas could be used to keep him warm on the ski slopes as well. This led to the innovative climate vest. 
Another important part of experimenting is taking things apart. This could be anything from products, processes or even ideas. Michael Dell, at age 16, was so excited to get his new Apple computer that he even made his dad go to the UPS office with him to pick it up. To Dell's parents' dismay, after they pulled into his driveway, he jumped out of the car, carried the precious cargo to his room, and the first thing he did was take the new computer apart. His parents were infuriated, as an apple cost a lot of money in those days, and he had demolished it. But as he said, I just wanted to see how it worked. Finally, it's important to test ideas through pilots and prototypes. Traditional experimentation, if you will. Jennifer Hyman of Rent the Runway noticed her sister, despite being on a good salary, would agonize over what dresses to buy. So Hyman thought, what if you could rent dresses? Her first pilot was at Harvard University. They bought 100 dresses from designers like Diane von Furstenberg and Calvin Klein, and letting women try the dresses on campus found that many ladies rented them, even returning them in good condition. The next test was to see if women could rent dresses even if they couldn't try them on. This test was done at Yale, and they found that although there were less sales, will women still rented the dresses. Finally, they tested their product in New York City, but this time only with photos of the dresses. Sales dropped dramatically to just 5%, but scaled for an internet venture, that's still a large percentage. Today, they have more than 600,000 members. At its heart, Hyman was using a version of Eric Ries' Lean Startup Method, where measured customer feedback is used to guide innovation.